Expedition 44. Welcome back. We're in a long series on the church. Probably going to be our longest series ever. Longer than we thought it would be. And I think we're probably only halfway through. So this yeah. is probably going to take a good year. So we decided to kind of take a little bit of a sort of break. Now I say sort of break because we're going to do a short series on the Epistle of James. But the Epistle of James talks a lot about church. <laughs> yeah. So it sort of uh, fits with what we're doing, and I might even sort of brand it that way. But Matt, what are, what are we doing today? Yeah, so starting on this Wednesday, I'm teaching a class on James. So we thought we would throw it into our series here. Like you said, it ties a ton into the church now. Um, the Epistle of James has kind of been controversial throughout history, um, yeah. especially when it comes to finding where it fits in the canon. Yeah. And it's probably always been my favorite New Testament book because there's just so much things so much that's different about it than the rest of the writings and it's almost got like an old testament flair but it has been controversial yeah so some of the reasons is like the the latin the western church fathers never mentioned it until the fourth century yeah so we got three four hundred years of writing and it's never mentioned so yeah. james was absent from one of the first western canons um which that list was found in 170 a.d um Tertullian quotes scripture over 7,000 times, and yet in his writings he never quotes James. Yeah. And we might start getting into some of the reasons why that is as we go along and things, but there was a, definitely a, an interesting flair of whether or not this was formally accepted, who wrote it, all mm -hmm. kinds of different things going into it. There's everything gets questioned. The Greek of the, the book, whether it's good or poor or anything in between. Um, Nobody seems to just accept the book of James the way it is. They, everybody kind of wants to work through it and work through every every little piece. There's some people that say it, it shouldn't be part of the canon, although I don't think that's a very strong or accurate yeah. straight statement. And then there's other people that would even argue that it's, it's, it's more fitable than any of the other ones as part of the New Testament canon. Yeah, so let's look a little bit at the Eastern Church. We kind of gave some highlights from uh, the Western side of the empire, you could say. So the Syrian church was the first to accept James into its canon, and the Greeks in the east accepted James very early. So Origen was the first one to quote it in the 200s, and he attributes it to James, the brother of Jesus. Yep. Whereas the very first manuscript that we have, which is much later in the west, um, to the western fathers, they attributed to James Zebedee, the disciple. Yep. So. Yep. I think with uh, when, when you get Origen quoting it, and he specifically quotes it as scripture, scripture and the brother of Jesus, Origen is, is pretty solid. We don't usually argue with a lot that Origen says, particularly Matt and I really like a lot of his mm -hmm. writings, and so he's pretty solid as far as we're concerned. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of different reasons why you would consider it that way too, and we'll get into yeah. some of those. Uh, Eusebius he accepted James in a list of his writings, but notes that he was aware that others didn't. Yeah. especially in the, the western part of, of the world. Um, uh, Bishop, um, what was that? Athanasius. Ace? Oh, okay. Sorry, I couldn't even remember. <laughs> uh, yeah, Athanasius. He has the most famous list of um, basically the same canon we have right now. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people go back to um, the books that we attribute to the New Testament and the Old Testament were all on Athanasius' list. He was one of the most famous Eastern fathers, and he includes James... Um, without question, and since it's, and it hasn't been really questioned since the Reformation. Right, and so that's where this kind of comes into play. So when you look at early church fathers, there's not a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So one of the things with you and I is that in the East. we go back to Eastern way of thinking, mm -hmm. and we go back to early church fathers Especially over Eastern and over fathers. and over. Yes, and so so that's why, you know, when I said earlier that when you get to Origen and uh, some some of these we've mentioned, that Matt and I like to kind of go with the way that they thought. In fact, a lot of our Expedition 44 thinking is the way that those early church yeah. fathers thought. What we don't like is what seems to happen about 1,700 years later when mm -hmm. things need to <coughs> be reformed. And yeah. so the Reformation comes in. It's then that you start getting some question marks with the book of James, particularly with Luther. Yeah. And so he's going to question the book. In fact, I would even say that he wanted it outright gone out of the canon. So if Luther could have rewritten the canon, James wouldn't have been in there. And mm -hmm. as you guys know, we're not big Luther fans for the most part. And so, so 
just that alone makes me kind of take the side of James more than anything else. But let's talk a little bit about Luther and the Epistle of Straw. Yeah, so that was what Luther called James, was the Epistle of Straw, and he wanted it along with Hebrews, Jude, and Revelation what does removed that mean? from the cabbage. What does Epistle of Straw mean? Yeah, he said, he claimed that it contained nothing of the gospel. Okay. And he had a big issue with kind of the controversy of faith and works, where Luther, in his translation of Romans, adds in that we are saved by faith alone. He had the word alone into yeah. there, where the only time that you can see those two words, faith and alone, together in Scripture, is in James, where it says, you are not saved by faith alone, but by works as well. So, so this is going to get into a, a large debate of what is the gospel. And, we've done, and what are works. And what are works. <laughs> we've done a... series on both of those yes. subjects. And so we're not going to side with the Luther idea of what the gospel is. We're going to take more of an early church idea yeah. of what the gospel was. Yeah. So we don't agree with pretty much anything Luther said on the book of James. And, and mm -hmm. that's in part way why we're doing this series today is because I, I think that... Uh, too much of Reformed theology wants to put James down or point fingers at it, and we think there's a lot of amazing things in the book of James. Yeah, so some of the reasons James was, some more reasons that it was controversial um, for being put into the canon was that James only mentions Jesus twice in the entire letter. Yeah. So James 1.1 1, 1 and James 2.1 yeah. um, only mentions the Holy Spirit one time as well. Yeah. And so there's a lot of focus on God the Father in it, which so some would attribute that, oh, well, those could have been interpolations, those things just put in to make it sound Christian, right. which just could come off as simply just a Jewish letter. Yeah. When you read uh, James and you read his idea of justification at first, and I'll call it plain reading, which is the way most Americans are going to read yep. the text, at face value. it seems to be a contradiction to Paul's view of justification. So you have to figure that out and work through it and decide, are these two different uh authors that feel differently differently about it this comes into the idea of inerrancy mm -hmm. and things right. like that we're going to just barely touch on that yeah is this a critique of paul yeah so so you have to figure out the contradiction and how you're going to hold that with the book of james and obviously that's one of the reasons why luther didn't like it because luther had his twist or play on what he was trying to get Paul to say mm -hmm. and wanted to argue that James was contradictory to that. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to the emphasis that James continually puts on action or doing yeah. the doing the commandments or doing doing the works yeah. <laughs> is what it seems, yeah. rather than Luther's version of faith as mental assent or checking certain right. belief boxes, yep. you could say. Um, and so this really makes James trouble for Reformed theology. Right. And so that's part of the reason that in the 1700s with the surge of the Reformation, people like Luther wanted to remove James from the canon yeah. because it didn't line up with his reading of Paul. Exactly. All right, so let's talk about the author and date, and we're going to start getting into the text a little bit when you get into the author and date. So starts out James 1.1a, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, so the author identifies himself as James, or if you were to train, like literally translate it, uh, Jacob, yeah. Yacoba. Yeah. Yacoba. <laughs> so, yep. yep, and so who is this individual? The New Testament knows of four different James, so which of the four... Is it? Yep. Which James is it? Which one are we talking about? So we today? got James, the son of Zebedee. He was called to be a follower of Jesus. You can see that in Mark chapter 1, verse 19. So James, along with his brother John and Peter, become kind of the closest apostles to Jesus, disciples yep. to Jesus. You can kind of see that in Mark 5, Mark 9, Mark 10, Mark 14. Yeah. You, we next, also have James, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, he is also one of the 12. And so... He's going to be mentioned only in the list of the apostles, possibly Mark 1540 as James the Younger or James the Lesser, if you remember mm -hmm. that. Um, there's also a parallel in Matthew 2756, so that's an mm -hmm. option. Yeah, if you watch The Chosen, you got Big James and Little James. Yep. So Big James is James Zebedee, Little James is James the Lesser, James the Younger. Um, then you also have James, who's the father of Judas. This isn't Judas Iscariot, um, but he is identified um, Judas his son was okay. identified among the other Judas among the 12. Um, and some identify him as Thaddeus. Yep. So, so you get a couple scriptures there. You've got Matthew 10, 3 and Mark 3, 18. Yep. That's going to kind of pull those together. And so the fourth James that we have in the New Testament is James, who's Jesus' brother. And this is the option that the majority of the world leans toward. Yeah. Matt and I don't really, you know, we look at the first three, and because we don't leave any rock yeah. under turn, we're, we're going to mm -hmm. mention these, but we don't give it a whole yeah. lot of merit. We pretty much just fall with the last one of mm -hmm. saying 
saying it, it seems to be by far the best option. Yeah, so the most of the early church fathers, except we have one reference in the Eastern Fathers on a manuscript of James that claims it's James Zebedee. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, it's pretty much unanimous that it's James, the brother of Jesus, yep. and throughout the rest of church history. But this does bring up an interesting question in that James, or the author of James, doesn't identify himself very well yeah. in the first couple of verses. And so this is something that that has led to a lot of question marks here. And when you listen to, um, if you go on YouTube and listen to other specials on James, one of the things that comes out of it is you kind of get this hierarchical slant sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so wh what you get is you get people saying he doesn't need to introduce himself because... He has so much authority. He has so much authority and he's that, the head of the entire church of Jerusalem as if it's a mega church or something yeah. like that, you know, as if he's this huge prominent figure. Matt and I don't really like that kind of talk. <laughs> no. Like it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, first of all, we're going to get into the dating, but how big is the Church of Jerusalem at this point? Yeah, we don't know. We don't know. Maybe and a it, couple hundred. It doesn't seem know. very big compared to the standards of churches today, although yeah. I'm not sure that our churches today fit the New Testament definition yeah. of a church today, so that gets controversial. But but you also look at at what what is going on. Now, the whole part of this book is really written with, complete humility. Mm -hmm. And so where I take his his lack of description at the front is it's taking Jesus's words of, of humbling yourself into complete obedience mm -hmm. where you yourself are almost nothing. Yeah. And so it almost doesn't matter who wrote this. This is this is the words that, that the church needs to hear, the, the letter, the recipients that are going to be listening. It's it's as if it's written, you know, from a brotherly love perspective of Jesus himself in the in the form that I should be taking on the image of Christ I should be following after Jesus and then I'm mentoring or discipling those underneath and they're looking at me in the same way follow me as I follow Jesus yeah um, so like we mentioned a lot much of the early church credits this letter to James the brother of Jesus origin Eusebius identify him as the author and also they call him the, the bishop uh, or an elder of Jerusalem um, Eusebius and Josephus both report him as being a martyr of the gospel um, and he was stoned to death around 62 AD so a lot of scholars date this to shortly before his death in 62. So I think I want to ask the question why wouldn't I mean both of us were saying that we just kind of automatically accept this as Jesus's brother why do some people have a hang-up with it? Yeah so um, kind of the reasons that people reject James is the style they say might represent either poor Greek like you said or yeah. elegant Greek um, and they, the, those who take the elegant Greek um, view of this really take that how could um, this amount of sophisticated Hellenistic Greek language be learned by the son of a carpenter? It's also, when you get into the dating, I mean, it doesn't matter where you put the dating, it tends to be a little bit early compared mm -hmm. to everything else. And so, you know, as, as Christ's followers, particularly his disciples, <laughs> continue to follow they started out as normal people yeah. and then they're going to start learning greek a little bit because they're mm -hmm. realizing that it needs to be recorded and the greek again there's an argument where i would say that the normal scholar is going to say the greek is very elegant but mm -hmm. there's a couple hang-ups with that that would make you go was it a student writing eloquently that messed uh -huh. up every once in a while or what exactly is going on there yeah so i think a lot of the greek uh, the debate comes between James's language is so close to the Septuagint. Yeah. Like he uses tons of words that aren't found throughout the New Testament, but are found in the Septuagint. Yeah. Now, Septuagint was written in the common tongue, yep. and so it was kind of the everyday business language, right. you could say, not the language of the temple or the priesthood yeah. or anything like that. So that's the, where the debate comes in is, is this really eloquent, eloquent Greek, right. or is this the common tongue, you know? So it's taking like street language Greek, and but making it, it poetic. Making it poetic, <laughs> yeah. Which is actually what the Old Testament is known for. It has uh -huh. a very much feel of the Old Testament books of wisdom, uh -huh. where they're using their street language. I mean, but a lot of it poetic. David's writing yeah. is like that. I mean, words that nobody else used, and he used them either because they rhymed or they had a wordplay or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or in some cases, it was just exactly what his heart was feeling but it wasn't incredibly eloquent. So I'm going to kind of say that there's a lot of these kind of Old Testament feelings to the book as well. Yeah, uh, the second reason we kind of already mentioned is the letter 
doesn't have like could be very Jewish and it doesn't have to be distinctively Christian. A lot of yeah. these concepts you say are found in the Old Testament. He only mentions Jesus twice, only mentions the Spirit one time, and some would say that oh well those two verses could be interpolations or just Jesus being put into this. It's very much of a, a, a Jewish ethic. Um, and we'll, we'll address all of these concerns um, yeah. right after we kind of list them all. So the big part of this is that there were tons of writings during mm -hmm. during this era. and It could have looked like this. Yeah, it could have looked like this. And most of these writings, they weren't totally sold on whether Jesus was the Christ or not. It was controversial. Mm -hmm. And so this, this letter, some are going to say, could have a very non-Christian flair or appeal to it. And when you get into... James is the brother of Christ, that might make sense because historians might even argue that early in, in his life he wasn't sure if Jesus was the Christ. And you mentioned the Chosen earlier, and in some of the early Chosen episodes, they even brought that point out, that he was sort of questioning some of that. Yeah. So kind of the third thing is why they don't um, necessarily put it to James is because they think it's later, like a second century thing that reflects the theology they think of the Ebionites, which was an early Jewish Christian sect that stripped kept the Mosaic law, but questioned the divinity of Jesus. Yeah. And so they try to take what we just mentioned in our second yeah. rejection and apply it to this group, which was a second century group, um, and try to make it um, not as Christian. So what's going to happen is right away there's going to be a little bit of con controversy. Whenever it was written, you know, kind of mm -hmm. where does this fit in? And then over the course of time, particularly with early church fathers, it's going to slip into the acceptance. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be challenged again in the Reformation. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was the fourth thing is James was slow to be accepted into the canon um, through the first three centuries yeah. of Christian history, um, which bring about people's doubts of its early dates and James's authorship and the genuineness of the claims of the author. Yeah. Yeah, so due to this, some also think that it might have been a pseudonymous letter, uh, yeah. su writing under a pseudonym, which is a, a false description, somebody writing in the name of James. But we do know, even early 2nd century, the church really rejected that point of view. So it wouldn't have been accepted even early by origin into the canon if that was even the case. Right. So you do get this idea when you look into early, early church history, about the time that all the New Testament uh, writings were being penned that there's some pseudonymity going on. Mm -hmm. So there's people writing things and they're not putting their name on it for or various reasons. It to somebody else. Yeah, they're they're going to say it's it's persecution, or mm -hmm. they're going to say this person wrote it when they didn't write it, and mm -hmm. and it was heavily frowned upon. So obviously, if you're doing your due diligence in the way that James uh, has a lacking of saying exactly who mm -hmm. wrote this book. It's a good idea to say, could this be what it is? It's, yeah. it's good scholarship to, to question the pseudonymity idea, but mm -hmm. I don't think it holds a whole yeah. lot of water. Yeah, so the, there was a bishop who wrote a Third Corinthians who, yeah. um, it was found out, and he was kind of excommunicated for yeah. doing that. Right. They took it very seriously, yeah. so it's... It's not a very good argument to say that this is pseudonymity. Yeah. So. Now, I will say that that was fairly common in the day. And so mm -hmm. today we always like want to quote Revelation and say, you know, don't add or detract from this or, you know, uh, you'll, uh, you know, thunder will come out of heaven and strike you dead yeah. where you stand or something <laughs> like that. It was a little bit differently thought of in the first century time. It, it wasn't... It wasn't as looked down upon as it was, you know, two, three hundred years later, later and yeah. definitely now. All right, so let's respond to some of these objections now. Um, so the first one is about the language. Um, and so because of centuries of Hellenistic influence in Jerusalem and Israel and particularly in Galilee, um, it isn't impossible that James could have learned Greek through doing business as a carpenter and yeah. traveling to the big cities and doing that. So, uh, and we also know that um, quite often a practice, especially at these early writings, is they would hire a scribe, an amanuensis. Yeah. So does it necessarily mean that James had to have physically penned this, or did he have a secretary, a scribe, writing down what it was and formulating that into this poetic thing? And we brought this this point out a lot. In fact, almost every time we do an introduction, we bring this out as a mm -hmm. viable concern. In fact, most of Paul's works are attributed directly to him when there's a good chance that he's having mm -hmm. somebody scribe those yeah. works. And so um, I mentioned that uh, 
also in Revelation when we were doing yeah. our big section on yeah, Revelation, First Peter. First Peter. And yeah. so, so this is a really viable option. And this is where I kind of go back to our conversation on what was accepted and what wasn't. And so this was very accepted. If I have a scribe write my work, do I put Dr. Will Ryan on it or do I put their name? Well, almost every time it would still have my name on it. The mm -hmm. scribe doesn't really get any, any credit for doing yeah. that. Nobody's going to necessarily argue that. So it's mm -hmm. a viable contention. Yeah, so the next argument was about why is Jesus only mentioned like twice in the letters. So, yeah. um, now the thing is, is that James regularly alludes to Jesus' teachings, uh, particularly from the Sermon on the Mountain, Sermon on the Plain, some 35-ish times yeah. it, throughout that you can pick out the teachings of Jesus and numerous other theological concepts which parallel the early church and the Jesus tradition and so you can say that the letter of James is thoroughly Christian. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's, in my mind, there's not a lot of debate going on whether it's Christian or whether it's simply Jewish. And now it has a lot of flares of Judaic writing, but, but that's in the style more than it is in necessarily the content of what it's saying. So mm -hmm. what Jesus said is also what the book of James says, and what the book of James says is what Jesus said. That, there, yep. It's not contradictive material. And so when you're looking at other, and there are a lot of, as I mentioned, there are a lot of particularly apocalyptic literature yep. being written in this area yep. with, with, the, uh, with Rome and the way that they were doing. And you, when you read all of that, what you get is contradictive information. Yeah. You get stuff that was not necessarily what Jesus was saying, but it could have been things that Old Testament scribes and uh, uh, rabbis were saying that was contradictive to what Jesus was saying. So what we're not reading in uh, the book of James, I might use like the war scroll, mm -hmm. one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, they were ready for war. They yeah. were ready for battle. They, they write, the, the whole scroll is written on how to be prepared to go to battle against Rome. And obviously that happened. That's what they thought. But I would say, was Jesus in that war? Didn't look like <laughs> no. it. Didn't look like it. And yeah. so, I mean, some people are going to question the Masada thing. And could that have been, I mean, the, the full preterists are going mm -hmm. to get into this conversation. But we would typically look at that and say, James is very much in line with the teachings of Jesus. I mean, mm -hmm. I would even, I would even argue even more so than a lot of the other mm -hmm. writings of the New Testament. So. It seems very anti-zealot as well. Yes, exactly. Which is very in line with Jesus. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. so the third thing is um, many of James' instructions do kind of find non-Christian Jewish parallels, but that doesn't mean that they're not Christian. Right. And obviously, the the Christian community is developed out of like the original Christians were Jews. Yeah. And so yeah. you're going to have that culture being in there. It wasn't till later in the destruction of the temple, which kind of, we saw the split of the synagogue right. and, and the, the ecclesia, which kind of actually gives more evidence for an early date of the letter than it does a later date. Yeah. Um, so those are some of the things and kind of the, the slower acceptance of James into the canon um, probably had more to do with the, like we talked about the, the supposed conflicts between the letters of Paul and, and James rather than do, dealing with the authorship of James. Right. So there are other branches of faith. We don't talk about this mm -hmm. a lot, but you know, even within Judaic thinking, mm -hmm. some people are going to look at Jesus as the Messiah, but there's still a lot of other different ideas going around. And so, so you kind of see a competitive nature of Christianity and other flavors going along. So scholars ask, could this be one of those other flavors that's kind of circulating around rather than Christianity? And my answer would be, no, no. it fits with Christianity yeah. a whole lot better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so last, the allusions of um, to James in the late first century, um, there are allusions to James, though it's not mentioned by name, in First Clement and in Shepherd of Hermas, and this gives a whole lot of evidence for an early date as well. There's seven allusions and almost exact quotations of James in the letter of First Clement. Yeah, and so that gives a good, some good evidence that this could be very much a an early date um, for James. Now, personally, when to, okay, let me just start by saying. Usually when you talk about early authorship of the New Testament, the kind of year that you use is pre-70 AD. And that's destruction of the temple. Exactly. And so what was written pre-70 AD? Well, you, if you listen to any of your videos, you're going to know particularly me and, you know, I would put Matt in this yeah. group, although he questioned some of the stuff. I would say almost everything was written pre-70 AD. But when you're, when you're listening to what all the scholars, both Christian, non-Christian scholars, saying, they keep wanting to 
put the Christian writings later than 70 mm -hmm. AD. And so what are the evidences that this was written first pre-70 AD? Um, the use of synagogue in James 2.2 2 seems to point to a time before 70 AD. We know that the relationship between Jews and Christians and the synagogue nature kind of thing there became a little more separate after 70. There's some evidence here that these Christians, Jews, Gentiles, Jewish Christians, Messianic Christians, are still in some way connected to the synagogues here from what James alludes to in James 2.2. So if you're following, and this might be new to you, so I kind of always like to spell mm -hmm. it out a little bit, but Matt mentioned the Septuagint. And so the Septuagint is going to be written hundreds of years before this, mm -hmm. but it's the normal person language. It was the Bible that everybody could read because they weren't necessarily allowed to go to where the manuscripts were, which were in the synagogues. And so you kind of had to be in rabbinical training to go and get your hands on any kind of synagogue. And that's why you get these idea of people kind of standing on the corner reading it, and there's all of those people listening to the actual scripture yeah. being read. You had to trust the rabbi that was reading the scripture because they're interpreting it into a different language as they're reading it. Do you trust their interpretation? Do you not trust it? All these things are going on. And then when Christ comes, the Christians are going to go through this thing where they're not really welcome in the synagogue because it's a different religion. <laughs> and so you have rabbinical Hebrews that are looking for the Messiah and you have this guy saying I am the Messiah and they're saying no you're not we're gonna crucify you eventually and so there becomes a, a time where those following the Messiah aren't welcome nor do they want to be in the synagogues and so the fact that you have some synagogue uh, writing in James is going to put it early between they were before they were totally kicked out and I would actually say that that's a really good reason to put this early. really early uh-huh yeah yeah um some date it back to 50s yeah so yep. scott mcknight i believe does yep. um and there's others that dated early 60s late 50s yep. um another is that um when we talked about this the jewish flavor of the letter is very similar to the early the, the writings at this time before 70 yep. Um, yep and then the last thing is there's no signs of james addressing gnosticism in the letter which was more of a, a, a later thing. If you could still like Gnosticism was much later than after the destruction of the temple. There were seeds of it in the water. You can yeah. see some of this stuff in the in the epistles of John and Colossians and stuff like that that the seeds of it were going. But James doesn't even allude to it, which gives evidence that this is pretty early. Yeah. And when you really get into Gnostic study, you're going to see that, that the way that we think of Gnosticism didn't come about until a long yeah. time after this. 200s. Yeah, 200s. That's 200. That's 150 to 200 years after all these thoughts are being put in. So as Matt said, there's seeds in the water, but we read that into it more uh -huh. than anything. Yeah. So. yeah, but James doesn't mention any of it, and it's definitely not Gnostic. It's right. very Jewish. <laughs> right, exactly. um, and so he doesn't even address it. So. Yeah. So there's no real good reason then to take a late date and to deny James' authorship here is kind of the point that we're getting to. In, in late date meaning post-70 post AD. Yeah. So, so first we're just getting post-70 AD out of the way, and then we, you know, as Matt alluded to, like, is, is it written really early in the 50s or is it written sometime in the mid-60s? Yeah, and so um, the next thing we need to address, so we kind of addressed in that first half of the first verse of James is he says he's James. And so we addressed who James who was here. James, yeah. <laughs> and so now we're like, he uses the term that he is a bondservant, a, a, a doulos. And so, Ryan, what does that mean? Well, that's pretty interesting that he uses that because this is going to be slave master language. Yeah. 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 Um, and if this is Jesus' brother and you brought up the thing of, we listened to a few YouTube videos just to see like, what's out there right now? What What's right. the American church saying right. about, right. about James? And they always put it that James has this like high authority because yeah. he's the... He's the CEO, pastor, or whatever, bishop, the first pope, whatever. Unarguable <laughs> authority, authority of the church. church. Yeah. But he doesn't even, like, he could have pulled that title being like, hey, I'm Jesus' brother. Right. But he doesn't even do that. He uses no. the language of a slave right. rather than the language of a high position. Yeah. He uses the lowest position that you could have to communicate that he's simply a servant of Jesus. He could have said, hey, I'm James, Jesus' brother, you better listen to me. Yeah. But instead he says, hey, I'm, I'm James, a bondservant of Christ. Yeah. And so it, it implies a few things um, to be a bondservant. It means absolute obedience. Yeah, slaves know their place. And mm -hmm. so this kind of goes back to 
some of the writings of Paul and then taking complete humility all the way to the Christ of Jesus that I kind of uh, alluded to, but, but he's not questioning his place. He's going to automatically put it there and kind of with the flavor of, you know, follow me as I follow Jesus, that you should follow me in this complete humble uh, obedience all the way to the cross. Yeah, and the next thing is it implies to be a doulos, a, a bond slave, is that absolute humility. Yeah. And so we're not looking at positions of hierarchy, right. um, positions of authority as we think of it here in the, the West, but you're seeing somebody who is basically totally sold out in ser humble service to God, reflecting yeah. Jesus. So you have obedience, you have humility. Now the other one, Matt and I talk a lot about, and this is loyalty. Yeah. It's got a sense of loyalty, and this is obedience, faith, allegiance <laughs> language. And so we always bring the idea out that, you know, if you study the Caesars, they're asking for allegiance or soul obedience as if they are God. And so, so yeah. much of the writings of the early church were saying you can't have two masters. And this mm -hmm. is the dual loss thing yeah. again coming in of, of like, are you, are you going to serve Rome and Caesar or are you going to serve Jesus? And so I love the way that this starts out because it's beautifully in line with one master. master. Yep. Um, and so this term doulos also like has some Old Testament connections in the Septuagint. You have Moses being called the doulos of God. Um, you have Joshua and Caleb taking on that title. Um, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Deuteronomy 9 there. Um, so it was Job, Isaiah. They were all known by this term of servants of God. Yeah. And this is tied in very much to the same way that we look as a shepherd. Mm -hmm. And so servant, shepherd, their total inhumility um, to the mission of Jesus. And again, this is why... <laughs> I really like have a hard time when I'm listening to something on YouTube or a sermon online and it kind of takes this hierarchical approach to it because we do this a lot. We get it exactly wrong and this mm -hmm. is exactly wrong. This is the polar opposite of what's going on. And yep. so, so what it looks like is complete humility in the form of a, of a total slave master relationship because you've, voluntarily put yourself into that mm -hmm. place as Jesus took on the mindset of mankind and and emptied himself to do that. That's the same thing that's going on here. And so in our mind, as we read this and as we read that that is linked to the mindset of shepherds, the most lowly people mm -hmm. in the Old Testament, and then it filters into the church leaders. So if we're saying that this is James, the brother of Christ, the leader of the Church of Jerusalem, whether it's 50 people or 5,000, although I tell you it wasn't 5,000 at this mm -hmm. point. But but if it was, it still takes on the total idea of complete humility, which unfortunately you get a lot of people that want to twist this to go the other way. Yep. And it's simply when you support their CEO mindset. Exegetically, it's not there. Yep. And so what that term doulos is translated as in the new testament is the idea of all-in discipleship yeah and that's yeah. really what it comes down to is james is saying hey i'm an all-in disciple like you said like perfect like, submission perfect yeah. submission that's what all-in discipleship complete. looks like yeah, yeah yeah it's so beautiful yeah. yeah and so yeah let's move on to the audience so the second part of james um 1 1 says who james is writing to yep. which is to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad and he says greetings so that doesn't really help us so we talk about the diaspora a lot and when you talk about that, it could go all the way back to 586 BC, and then it could go all the way forward until post-70 AD when everybody was really yeah, being scattered. dispersed. So, <laughs> yeah. so unfortunately, when we talk about the diaspora, you have this whole thing. But what's interesting is is 12 tribes. That's mm -hmm. going to kind of give us a little bit of a hint here. Yeah, because um, so the diaspora thing of the original exile was only the 10 northern tribes. Yeah. And so now he's adding the other two in. So what? how could this be? Um, so this could be that James could be just talking to Jews outside of Jerusalem, no matter what tribe they were from, many Messianic Jews at this time. Um, and so this view could be that the audience is strictly Jewish. Yeah. It is interesting to, to think, why does he include 12 instead of 10? It would have been just as mm -hmm. easy to say 10 tribes, but he goes back and tries to reclaim the 12 as if, as if they weren't lost. And mm -hmm. so there's something going on in the text, and we often think of 
our job as Christians evangelically is to reclaim all that's been lost. Now, I've just about given up on that notion mm -hmm. personally. Now, this is where Steve Castle and I start to have an argument over this. Is I, I say I'm in the waiting, and if, if God's Spirit sends somebody to me, I'm going to bring them into that camp, more as if they did in the Old Testament than anything yeah. else. But I don't see this vast reclaiming of the world. Now, I'm kind of waiting on Christ to do that personally, where mm -hmm. Steve thinks that he's been enabled by Christ to do that. And I don't necessarily disagree with him on that. I'm just saying, when does that start? Because our world doesn't look anything like that right now. Yeah. And so, so it's interesting, contrary to my personal view, that he seems to think that the reclaiming has actually already happened. Mm -hmm. And some people are going to say that the full reclaiming happens through the cross. And so this is where you get into a theological debate of did the authors think that all that was necessary to be reclaimed was the cross? And this gets into all kinds of universal reconciliation <laughs> conversations. And again, not to be, don't get that mixed up with pluralism. That's yeah. not all roads lead to Jesus. This is, you believe in Jesus, but there's an idea of hell and you know eternity that's going to get kind of spun and we've got videos on that so we don't need to all that. get into that but again we're not leaving any rock unturned and just simply by mentioning the 12 post cross so immediately if i'm almost putting seems like they've been regathered if i'm putting things in a place i would go boy it sure seems with that statement like he might be leaning a little towards universal reconciliation and everything has already been regathered yeah um the other thing is he could be using symbolism um of the 12 uh, disciples apostles yeah. as the reconstituted 12 tribes yep, you and those there. who are coming under under them who are under christ um that they're they're part of jesus's body and yeah. that's the reconstituted 12 tribes jesus is the true israel they're his 12 tribes right, exactly. that, that whole thing so it could mean um that this could be, James could just be talking to Jews, Christian Jews, outside Jerusalem, who scattered after the stoning of Stephen. We know that they went out, and we went over this in our apostleship thing. The Jerusalem model was when the persecution happened, they went out and they planted churches yeah. out there. So th these people who went out and did that could have been connected with James initially, part of the church that he was part of, and the congregations, the house churches around the temple there. And when the persecution after Stephen was stoned happened, they go scatter to the diaspora, and James is writing letters to these people who were, who he was in fellowship with. Now, we could get back into the dating a little bit, because I tend to go more with a very early date, a Scott mm -hmm. McKnight type of date of very yeah. early. However, the fact that he mentions the t spreading of the 12 and things like that, it mm -hmm. seems to be that the thought here is going to be that the church has already been regathered in this mm -hmm. way. And yeah. so so I would typically say that the church isn't regathered. Like when we read Revelation and the letters to the churches, mm -hmm. I would say the churches isn't totally regathered until later. So that makes my mind be a little more open to, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say post 70 AD dates, yeah. but it, it makes me open to the mid 60 dates and things like that. So I don't have the dating on this one totally figured out yet. Yeah, and so another meaning for this phrase, like a third one, could be that it's all Christians. All so that since Jesus is the true Israel, those like we talked about this just a second ago, those in him constitute part of the Israel of God as Paul uses that exact phrase for yeah. Gentiles right. in Galatians six sixteen. And Peter calls J Jews and Gentiles together elect exiles and part of the bride of the church. Um, so. In figuring this out, I would actually say, you know, a lot of people are trying to pit James and Peter against each other, oh, yeah. James and Paul against each other, and I would actually say that in this case, They're it's agreeing with each other. Agreement. Yeah. yeah, and Paul basically says the same thing in Ephesians 1 and 2, that Jews and Gentiles together are one new man, and they're the inheritors of the promises. Yeah. <laughs> so Matt and I fall in very much into this kind mm -hmm. of thinking of all Israel, the grafting mm -hmm. of everything, the church is yeah. all Israel, and it would be... To me, that would be the best understanding of why he would come out and say the 12 tribes right off is yeah. because he's already regathered. Yeah, and Michael Heiser makes some good points that um, at Pentecost, when um, the Holy Spirit's poured out, people are baptized, they go back to where they originally came from, the di diaspora, they are planting congregations, ecclesias, that are bringing in the, the pagans and the Jews to the Israel of God. So the regathering of the northern tribes, he points to, is actually the 
the birth of the church. Which is also, there's an amazing thing going on, the Table of Nations uh -huh. in 70, 72, the Septuagint comes in there with the same yeah. number and all that. So it's all tied together and just beautiful in the way that it happens. So when we look at 12 tribes dispersed, I, I don't think he he's talking about the literal 12 tribes. Right, right. He, he could be, obviously there's a Jewish connection. Yeah. So there's Jews involved, but Jesus calls that Jews and Gentiles are the one new man, and Jesus is the new Israel. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew makes that very clear that Jesus is the true Israel. The 12 disciples are the reconstituted 12 tribes, and Jesus cares about the people of Israel, and he wants them brought in. Now, this is why I go back to say that this is Christian language, uh -huh. not Jewish apocalyptic language, mm -hmm. because if it was Jewish apocalyptic language, which, if he says the 12 tribes up front, like, Right up front, I'd be going, oh man, is this apocalyptic language? Yeah. Because they're saying, literally, gather the 12 tribes to defeat Rome. That's mm -hmm. what they were thinking. Yeah. If we can just come together and arm ourselves, we're going to defeat Rome. And like I said, war scroll language kind of yeah. had that idea going on. If we could all just get together, but that's not at all seeming to be the flavor of the rest of this book. Yeah, so what we can know is James seems to be writing to Christians who are scattered throughout the nations, yeah. the Christian church, Jews and Gentiles together. Yeah. Um, All of Israel. And it seems, by the way James is writing, it could be majority Jews. Yeah. Um, because he's using a lot of the Old Testament flavor, but that's not out of the question that it could be a lot of Gentiles involved. We saw this with First Peter. He yeah. writes in a very Jewish way, and we concluded that it was probably a majority Gentiles that he was writing to yeah. in the letter of First Peter. So looking at different textures of interpretation, we've gone back and kind of described some of this, but we're, but we're really setting the page or setting the, the, the context here. What, what is the context? So whenever you talk context, you want to look at the theme or what, what kind of writing it is so that you get the right interpretation. Yeah, so some of the circumstances and themes here in James, he seems to be given an exhortation to congregations that are outside of, of Jerusalem. Um, so remember... In our apostleship episode, we talked about the Jerusalem model. We said of churches being planted by persecution. Um, these were likely people, like you said, that were part of a church with James in, in the past. James yeah. has relationships right. with these people that he's writing to. He's not writing as the Pope. He's right. writing to people that he has ministered and done, had body life with, people that he has relationships and a love of Christ with. So there's a couple themes sort of going on here, and I think one of them that we get is James is being an encouragement to several Christians along the way, maybe that, like Matt mentioned, he's met, met later that are going through some trials, some tribulations, mm -hmm. some things like that. But he's also going to be setting some course correction of, of kind of saying, bring it back this way a little bit. And so there's some, again, this is where some people would say there's some authority going on with the way that he does it. And I don't disagree with that, that he had the right of, mm -hmm. of a shepherd in yeah. course correction, but he's also doing it in humility. Yeah, and he uses, like we said, the Sermon on the Mount 35 times. So yeah. he's using the teachings of Jesus right. to do it and not teachings that are of his own. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's basing it on the teachings of the king. Yeah. One thing I really like about the way that James is written is, is right off the bat, he's going to kind of put an outline out there yeah. in front of us. And yeah. so people that, that are theolo theologically minded want to see kind of those outlines and uh -huh. where we're going with that because it keeps the context as you go. And so in James 1, 2 through 12, you kind of get those outlines. So let's kind of walk through those a little bit. Yeah, so in James 1, 2 through 4, we see how trials lead to our completeness of faith. Yeah. And so that's one of his big themes. He has three big themes throughout the letter. And that's one is how trials produce... Um, faith produce discipleship produce character that's more like Christ yeah my constant theme in my life he gets in one five through eight and that's going to be to seek your wisdom like I've said this has a feel of a wisdom an Old Testament wisdom literature book in fact this is probably why I like it the most mm -hmm. because I love the Old Testament wisdom literature and this has a very similar feel so he's he's contrasting the things of the world to the things of Christ and saying you need to be completely set set your mind your heart everything on above and this is why we say it's true discipleship this is what is going to separate the fans and followers from the disciples mm -hmm. And the third thing is he talks about favoritism and basically social status. So yeah. wealth, um, having no place in the upside down kingdom. It's interesting that this status gets talked about a lot, both by mm -hmm. Paul and James reiterates it here. And there doesn't seem to be a place for a 
hierarchy. Status or hierarchy. And, like, yeah. we hear that over and over. And this is where I talk about the opposites again. In yeah. that, like, Scripture says, don't do this over and over. And I look at most of our American churches and they're just... Totally the that. opposite. Yeah, <laughs> totally the opposite. Yeah. They're, they're CEO, pastors, you know, what's the pecking order? You look at almost any bulletin and you can see the pecking order right there. What is that communicating from day one? Yep. And then um, as we get through the rest of James 1, so James 1 basically lays out, like we said, all of, those are the three things yep. that he does um, in verses 1 through 12. So the trials lead to completeness, seek wisdom from above, not from the world, um, don't show favoritism or hierarchy or social status. Yep. They're opposite of the kingdom of God. Those are the three big ideas of James' letter. So James thir um, 1, 13 through 27 nails down into some more specific things underneath those three categories. Yeah. So in verses 13 through 18, um, it says not to blame God for your trials. Seems like we do that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Don't blame God for this. <laughs> so, and then he, he goes into after that in verses 19 through 25 that wisdom will result in actions. So yeah. wise doers of the word are contrasted with fools who use anger to bring about God's righteousness rather than true wisdom, which looks like Christ in his way of life. Seems like we're still struggling with that one, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then in verses 26 and 27, it's, it talks about true religion, speaking in love, and caring for the poor and the outcast. And that's the one that I think we've lost the most in Christianity today. And mm -hmm. I think you and I keep, keep coming back to this one and saying, like, our church just doesn't look nearly as much like christ as it could because we've fallen in this area the love the care for the poor this is a theme the way we speak to one another yeah <laughs> this is a theme in almost every new testament writing and this is what jesus kind of spends his whole life modeling for us yet today i've kind of said this before our government does a better job caring for the poor than our churches mm -hmm. do and you know even even us so i'm, I'm just going to use and i don't say this to brag in any way but over christmas uh I put a thing on Facebook, hey, who wants to donate to buy this homeless guy a truck? And everybody thought it was so grandiose, you know, and, you know, all, all kinds of people gave to it. We bought this guy a truck. And, it, and I got so many comments of, oh, this is the, this is the hands and the feet of Christ and things mm -hmm. like that. And that's true. I don't want to discount. Thank you for everybody that gave. I'm glad that you did that. But it came off as, so this is wonderful that this is happening, where the the other side of this is that this shouldn't come off as unusual at all yeah. or a christmas thing yeah we should be doing this over and over and every time in fact like i almost didn't post it because i didn't want it to look or feel like i'm kind of patting myself on the back or whatever but on the other hand i'm trying to shepherd towards people of like this isn't a christmas thing this mm -hmm. is the way we should be living yeah. as the body of christ we yep. should be doing this each and every day not just once a year which obviously you know I'm, I try pretty hard in this area, but still, like, I mean, it, I think the New Testament church was doing this kind of thing, like, All daily. The time. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, those were the, how James nails down into those main three categories of, he gives some summaries of what he's going to talk about after that. So, James teaches from two main sources. Yep. That he gets most of his, You've his, mentioned this a lot. Yep. The Sermon, Sermon on, on the Mount, Mount yep. and Proverbs. Yeah. Especially Proverbs 1 through 9. Yep. He get, gets a lot of his information from there. And so, and you mentioned that James is a, kind of a rhetorical mix of the teachings of Jesus. Now, I just want to say, say, hold on here, because if you follow us at all, you'll know Matt loves the Sermon on the Mount. This uh -huh. is like his one big New Testament thing is like he could tell you more about the Sermon on the Mount than anybody else I know. And I love wisdom literature and all the word plays. I just wrote something about that yesterday and, and all the things that are going on. And the way that James is written is Mixing really neat yeah it mixes the two and so as you can see this is going to be a lot of fun mm -hmm. like matt and i are really looking forward to diving into the book of james because there's all kinds of just great stuff going on in this text yep so when we get to james two through five i'm um, kind of finishing our outline of what we're going to go through here is that james has 12 teachings which fall under these three categories that we just covered and calls the church to wholehearted devotion to the way of Jesus. I just love the 12-3 thing going yeah. on here. So 12 twives, 12 teaching, and then obviously three categories. You know the, the significance of three. Yeah, so all of James teachings are grounded in what he calls the law of liberty, or the royal law, which is to love God and to love your neighbor, which is a summary of the entire Torah. And so that's the main theme of this entire letter. It's also interesting that we throw around this idea of liberty as Christian uh, nationalists yeah. today, and that might come a little bit into play Maybe as liberty we dive into looks more this. like being a bond servant. Yeah. <laughs> so what are the, let's talk about the big idea of James. Yeah, three big ideas. To be wholly devoted to God. 
not to the world. Yes. So that's number one. Second is to speak in love and to serve one another, especially the poor. So, looking at those big three, you can see why we're so excited about the book of James. Like, if we could take the church today and do three things. He said, if you if you gave us a magic wand and say, what three things do you want to accomplish tomorrow? I would say, I want to accomplish what James says. Yep. I want to be wholly devoted to God and not the world, that there, the church shouldn't be torn here. I want the church to speak in love, which is not what they really look like right now. No. And I want them to serve the poor, which is not what they really look like right now. So this is why this study is so good, because you have three things which I would say we're as a church not accomplishing at all right now when it's what James says is the most important thing yeah, for the church to accomplish. So James says, do these three things, and 2,000 years later I read the book of James and I go, we're not really doing any of those. So if we put this into our church series, it might be the best part of our church mm -hmm. series and that James just wrote us a little, we call it a book, it's really a letter. Mm -hmm. A letter, you can call it an epistle, about what we're supposed to be doing. So right now, if I were going to build a church, I would say this is what we should be doing. Yeah, those three things. Well, next time we're going to be going through James chapter one. We're gonna to try to tackle a chapter in each video. And so stay tuned. I'm glad you're here with us for this journey through James. May God bless you and keep you.